Hello and welcome back to Archaeology 101. In today's topic, I will be doing an overview of the prehistoric monuments that have intrigued the minds of writers and researchers for many hundreds of years now, and that is the Henge Monuments. Let's begin with some basics. What is a Henge Monument? Henges started construction in the late Neolithic period, around 3100 BC, and these carry on until about 2000 BC at the end of the Early Bronze Age. There are over 100 known Henge monuments in the UK, but there are definitely more which are yet to be discovered. Typically, these monuments are defined as a circular monument comprised of a ditch with an internal bank and at least one entrance. And they're usually about 20 metres or over in diameter. They can, they can be absolutely massive. There are variations on this design across Britain and Ireland, and we'll discuss that later. Henge was first coined in 1932 by Thomas Kendrick, and if you read his paper, he's not happy about the term himself, which is very confusing, and I'm not entirely sure he would enjoy that that word is still used to describe these monuments, because he himself at the time thought it wasn't a very good phrase to use. But as these things do, the word has just stuck. So now we always get into arguments about, oh, the word was derived from Stonehenge, but Stonehenge isn't even a henge by the definition of henge monuments. But that's a different discussion. Let's carry on. Prior to the late Neolithic period, during the middle Neolithic period, you have the hengeform monuments. The example on the screen is made up of consecutive pits, which create a circular design. Now, the one here is about 10 metres in diameter, and that's fairly typical of Hengefor monuments. This might be the concept design for the later Neolithic Henge monuments, but they just take this design and they just blow it up times by 10. It's quite incredible what these agro-pastoralist communities can do with just a digging stick and an antler pick, but they are able to come together and create these huge monuments. But They've been doing that for an incredibly long time. They've been building monuments since maybe about 3800 BC when the Long Barrow began. And you can also see on the screen there's the Cursus monuments, which are also not an easy feat considering their size. Uh, we know possibly even less about the Cursus monuments, but that's a completely different topic. But possibly the Henge comes from the Hengeform monument. I said in the beginning that these monuments had fascinated people for a very long time, and indeed they have, and I'll begin with some of these early pioneers into the research into Henge monuments. We've got to begin with John Aubrey, who was born in 1626, and he was one of the first pioneers in recording monuments such as Stonehenge and Avebury, and you can see one of his plans on the screen here. He also probably came up with the idea that these monuments were built by the Druids. Now, we would understand these people today as the Iron Age people. Uh, we would understand today that the Iron Age was about 800 BC up until the Roman conquest of 43 AD or thereabouts. Uh, and he believed the Druids built these monuments. And these ideas were pretty revolutionary for the time. You've got to remember that at, during this period, most people thought that the world was about 4,000 years old. Uh, we would understand that to be wrong today. And we'd also understand that these monuments were built much earlier than the Iron Age period. But this was groundbreaking stuff for the time. No one had ever drawn these monuments with such accuracy before. And these theories were at a slightly later period, built upon by William Stukeley, who also created amazing illustrations and drawings of the Wiltshire landscape and the stone monuments within. And you can see his 1722 illustration of Stonehenge here as it stood back then. And he also perpetuated the idea that the, the Druids had built these monuments. First comes the type one henge. This is a henge that has a single entrance with a single bank and a single ditch circuit like Armingall here in the photograph, which was excavated in the earlier 1930s. Later on in time, 
the Type 1A subclass was made, and this was to fit in hinges which had a single entrance, a single bank, but had a double circuit of ditches. Next comes the Type 2 henge. So this diagram is of Arbor Low in the Peak District, and this is a Type 2 henge. It has two opposed entrances, it has a single bank, and it has a single ditch circuit. Type 2 henges ended up being split into two subclasses with Type 2, and then later on Type 2A, as I will show in the next slide. The Type 2A hinges are made up of two opposed entrances, a single bank and two or more circuits of ditches. This example on the screen is the central Thornborough hinge, which is one of three, and that's from Yorkshire. Finally, we come on to the Type 3 henge, and I've used Avebury as the example here. These are henges which have four opposed entrances, a single bank, and also a single ditch. So do these classifications actually mean anything? The prehistorians in the 20th century bent over backwards trying to classify henges, despite their obvious variability. And I think the attitude now really is to not do that quite so much as there is just so much variation within henge design. There is no perfect one size fits all model. They are good at broadly indicating what a henge looks like. There are henges which look like type ones, but each individual henge will have its own idiosyncrasies, it will have its own slight variations, and it will also probably have different internal features such as the presence or absence of timber circles, stone circles, or human burials, for example. And the next slide should demonstrate just quite how much variation there actually is. In this diagram by Lucy Cummings in her PhD thesis from 2019, you can see a selection of designs of henge monuments. Now this is just one of them. There is another page of these, and this is not all henge monument design across Britain. But try to classify all of these into just those rigid subclasses. I strongly recommend you go and read Lucy's thesis. You can find it online, it's free and it has a really, really detailed, in-depth knowledge and background of henge monuments and all of these sorts of discussions. But this just gives you a glimpse of what we're actually dealing with. And I think we can safely say these subclasses just aren't going to cut it. The artifacts and material goods recovered from henges usually vary from grooveware pottery, animal bone and flint work. So this suggests to us that they are bringing animals to these places to feast, to sacrifice, perhaps. Uh, they're bringing goods with them inside grooveware vessels, dairy products, maybe even alcohol. And they're also processing all of these at the site, which is shown by the evidence of flint working. Human remains are also found at Henge monuments, not all of them, and generally not in great quantities. Stonehenge is a outlier here. There are lots of cremations at Stonehenge, but Stonehenge is a weird non-henge anyway, according to the classifications, but by the by. So henges are probably not solely involved with the dead. Stone and timber circles are also a common feature incorporated into henge monuments, and these tend to be later features. Numerous henge monuments within Northern Britain, Scotland, Wiltshire have stone circles. Stone circles can also be standalone monuments. They don't have to be associated with a henge monument. There are about 1300 stone circles across Britain. However, we might not know about all stone circles. Many have probably been destroyed in the past by agricultural practices or when a house is being built Prehistoric monuments were often purloined and broken up to build houses and also ripped up so that farmers could plough the land that they sit within. So there may have been many more stone circles than there are known. In fact, it wasn't too long ago that uh, excavations at Durrington Walls revealed that there probably was a stone circle within it itself. 
There have been few excavations on hinges and stone circles recently, so they're quite poorly understood, and their dating isn't well known either. It's estimated that they probably began after Henge monuments around 3000 BC, however. Dating of stone circles relies on dating evidence falling within the pits which are dug so that the stone can be inserted to stand upright within them. So something like charcoal would have to have fallen within that pit before the stone is put in and then archaeologists go on to, if they go on to excavate those stone holes, they can find that charcoal and then they can date them. But there are just too few monuments to put a precise measurement on national dating of stone circles. Okay, so what are henges for? The theories expounded for them is that they're a worshipping place, they're a burial place in some instances. Stonehenge particularly seems to have an affinity for the dead. There are quite a few cremations within that monument. There are a few inhumations cremations in henges around the country, but this doesn't seem to be their sole function. There aren't enough burials within these places to suggest that they are a cemetery, for example. They may have astronomical associations, and it has been theorised that the Thornborough henges, that trio of henges in Yorkshire, for example, represent Orion's belt. So possibly henges are there to commemorate particular celestial phenomena. They don't appear to be for long-term occupation. People are still mobile. They're not solely staying at henge monuments. So they're probably only coming to these places at particular times in the year. Despite the ditch in the bank, they probably aren't defended enclosures either. Most likely, and this is the boring uh, sort of explanation for them, is they most likely have many functions and it probably varies from henge to henge. Mobile people are coming to this permanent place and they're conducting a variety of social and ceremonial events. When we're looking at henges and their function, we've got to keep in mind that a lot of henge monuments are not isolated features. They do exist, but mostly they're still part of these landscapes. So the famous image on the right, for example, is Salisbury Plain, and it's quite clear that all these monuments are connected. Land a guy on the left there in Wales, that's also part of this monumental landscape with two henges, a cursus, and other features as well. So we've got to think about how connected these monuments are. Even though academics do obsess over that they're enclosed spaces and they're cutting off particular areas of land, they're not isolated features and they're probably part of something much bigger on the whole rather than just the single monument in itself. When discussing henges, it is very important to understand the key issues behind the research. So the dating of henges, I've already touched on saying that these are quite problematic. And the reason for this is that the dates from henges often come not from the primary feature of the henge, which is the ditch, which is the initial feature to be dug, creating the henge, but it comes from secondary features within the henge, such as burials or timber circles. And this is known as indirect dating, which will tell you when that burial was around or when that timber circle was burned down, for example, but it won't tell you when the henge monument itself was created. Henges are also not often excavated. They tend to be excavated in research settings for university digs. I myself was privileged enough to excavate at Mardenhend in Wiltshire. They're not usually excavated in commercial settings, mostly because developers will see that as a massive expense and they will tend to run away from that area screaming. The excavated henges tend to cluster around Wiltshire or Scotland that's just how things have turned out. Wiltshire contains very impressive stone circles and researchers since the 1800s have honed in on that area and they've excavated those features. The same goes for the Orkney Isles in Scotland. So we have quite a poor sample size of excavated henges in Britain. To make things worse, academics even today are still building narratives 
very overbearing narratives about Neolithic Britain just from these areas. They're taking henges excavated in Wiltshire and Scotland and then creating narratives about the whole of the Neolithic, which is incredibly misleading. And I find it quite disappointing that this is still happening. It is changing now, but we need to focus away from these two areas. And when you are looking at the narratives on henges, know that it's probably come from Wiltshire and Scotland. And you've got to think outside the box a little bit when it comes to the rest of Britain. So let's conclude on henge monuments. We've seen that they are complicated features and they have various designs which vary across the nation. It's uncertain on what their function actually is, but it's unlikely to be a singular function. And this becomes more obvious when we see that they're actually part of long-standing monumental landscapes. And we must be fascinated by the fact that these are large features which took many thousands of hours to build. And these were built by a mobile people who had very simple tools, but clearly had a yearning and a need to build these large monuments. And they meant something intensely powerful to these people from the late Neolithic period into the end of the early Bronze Age. Our narratives on henges may have been historically too narrow. This might be changing now, but we've seen that Wiltshire and Orkney monuments have largely driven the academic narratives behind them. And we should be wary when talking about henges in the future without getting a better sample size from elsewhere in Britain. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, I will leave the sources I used to research this video in the description below. I recommend if you are interested to start with Rethinking the Henge Monuments of the British Isles by Lucy Cummings. That's freely available online and it's a really good overview on the research behind Henge Monuments. And I will see you on our next exciting installment of Archaeology 101.